And I think it may have been our third anniversary. And, yeah, so right around, right around the stage that you're at here, I think. Yeah. And uh, so <clears throat> watch out for the, uh, the drunken trolley driver. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'll tell you the rest of the story about that guy later. But, um, but no, it's, it's very good to be here. We, we've known the Alexanders a long time and been excited about what uh, God is doing here and uh, very thankful uh, for that. And uh, before I uh, open up for any questions, I do want to kind of introduce my team because it dawned on me early in deputation uh, that God has uniquely uh, prepared our family for what uh, we, are, we are getting ready to do in Santa Barbara. Uh, God's blessed us with four kids, as you saw in the video. Our, our oldest is our daughter, and uh, you may need me to say that twice before it sinks in. The oldest is our daughter. Uh, when you look at the picture, she's uh, about a foot shorter than some of the boys, but uh, but Abby's uh, uh, 21, she'll be 22 here next month, and um, but she's uh, uh, finishing up Bible college, she's preparing to be an English teacher, and so uh, not sure what that's going to mean uh, in the future. She may come out and help us, she may end up going to work in a school or something, she may get married, who knows. But, uh, but the boys are all planning on coming to Santa Barbara with us, and as a matter of fact, two of them are there uh, right now, and uh, holding the fort there, uh, God blessed and allowed us. Uh, you, you heard the average rent was about four thousand dollars. We were able to get a, a four-bedroom uh, townhouse for slightly less than that, and so we're very thankful for that. So we've got uh, room for the boys, and they've got a two-car garage to stick all my books and uh, <laughs> and things like that. And so God has been very good to us uh, in in getting us uh, settled in there. And uh, so we're finishing up deputation, but uh, but the boys are really our uh, our team. And uh, the oldest of the boys, you, you actually heard from him this morning in the background of the, of the video, uh, he's our piano player, uh, Nehemiah, and he is a, a very gifted uh, young man uh, when it comes to music. He's got tremendous ear, and uh, he's got a heart to work hard at it, to uh, improve his skills and use it for God's glory. And so we're so thankful for that, and uh, thankful to have a, a piano player, and uh, because uh, not all church plans have yes. that privilege. Okay. And so we're very thankful for that. Uh, then our next oldest is Elijah. Uh, he's just graduated. He's uh, got a, a desire to go into cybersecurity or something along those lines. He enjoys you know, doing computer programming and uh, all those uh, meaningless numbers and things that you know, <clears throat> he understands it. And so you know, more power to him. But, uh, but he also enjoys using his talents um, for the Lord. And, and he's been involved in operating in the sound booth, doing the live stream, all, the, all those kinds of things that are sending church, and, uh, and has also uh, put together our website, um, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll put him to work with uh, a lot of different things along the way, I'm sure. And, uh, and then our youngest, Azariah, uh, he's 15, so he's stuck with us for at least a little while, and, uh, but God has uh, uh, given him a, a number of talents and interests that are, that are proving useful. Uh, he's uh, artistic, so he's been helping us try to figure out our, our logo, and uh, he's helped us with, uh, with Junior Church. He, uh, uh, he enjoys, you know, acting and, and uh, uh, making things fun for the kids, and so we're uh, thankful that he'll be able to help with children's ministry eventually. Uh, but he's also willing to be our song leader. And uh, so that'll be a tremendous help for me. Uh, I'm, sure, um, I'm sure Brother Alexander uh, appreciates uh, having his son do the same here because, right. man, having, <clears throat> having uh, to, to lead the singing, having to preach, you know, having all this stuff on your mind and all that strain on your voice is very difficult. And uh, so we're very thankful that he's willing to do that. And then as an added bonus, he also cooks and bakes. So, uh, so we're very thankful uh, to have Azariah on the team as well. And uh, so God's been very good to us. Uh, as Pastor mentioned, we've been on the road for about 19 months. And we've got uh, a little over 70% of our uh, support um, raised. Uh, but with the boys getting jobs, that, that probably is going to turn into you know 80% pretty quick as, as they start contributing to the household expenses. And, and uh, so we're very, uh, very excited uh, about this next phase. And so we're hoping, our planning really, to be done traveling out of state at least um, by uh, May, and uh, we'll probably do some short trips to churches in California, maybe Arizona, you know, on the weekends, uh, but we'll be focusing our time on knocking doors and sharing the gospel with uh, Santa Barbara, uh, and uh, we're just excited to see what God's going to do. And uh, so we're planning a, our official launch will be September 15th, and uh, so we'll be building up to that. We've had a number of churches uh, tell us they're willing to come out and help us blanket the area with uh, flyers and John Romans and things. And, 
and uh, so we'll do that leading up to uh, up to that launch. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll be uh, trying to uh, win some people to Christ and be begin discipling them, begin meeting with them, um, and so appreciate your prayers uh, with all of that. Uh, yeah. I tell people all the time, uh, God's blessed us with a, with a, a good amount of talent and, and abilities in our family, but uh, all the talent in the world won't start a church. Uh, yeah. God has to do it. And so I hope that you'll Amen. pray for us because uh, God does work in response to prayer. And I hope you believe that. And uh, uh, But any questions this morning about uh, Santa Barbara, California, our family, whatever? <clears throat> Deep doctrinal discussions. And, uh, we'll save those for later. But, uh, yes, ma'am. Here, there's a lot of gated communities. Are mm -hmm. there in Santa Barbara, or do you just have gates? Or <clears throat> um, fortunately, a, a lot of the housing in Santa Barbara is older. And so we don't have as much of the gated communities. Um, now, some of the uh, some of the outlying areas, like uh, like Montecito, some folks have heard of Montecito. That's right. That's a I suppose you could call it a suburb of Santa Barbara, but uh, but it's, it's it's its own orbit. It's a town of about ten thousand people, but most of those people are, are multimillionaires. Many of them are you know actors and famous people, and uh, and so you know they have their own gates that will have a hard time getting past. But um, but for the most part, in Santa Barbara, uh, it's you know, you can walk down the street, walk up the sidewalk, knock on a door, and um, you know, and, and people, people in California, we found too, are very, um, very open to talk to you. Um, they, they may not be um, excited about the gospel per se, but uh, we can give them some food for thought, and uh, God can use that. And so we're we're excited about the opportunities that it presents. But, uh, anybody else? All right, let's grab our Bibles. And um, I, I tried to trim down my notes as much as possible because I know we're packing a lot in at Missions Conference. And uh, so I will try not to be as long as your pastor usually is. And uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if he's, if he's toned it down, but I can remember days him preaching two hours. Easy. You know, just he gets carried away. I don't know. He'd have to wake me up afterwards. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm teasing, but <laughs> we always enjoyed having the Alexanders. That's why we kept having them back. I think we had them just about every year from about 2008 to, I don't know, whenever we stopped having them. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, Mark chapter 16. Did I tell you that? I'm sorry. I told you to open your Bible and they tell you where to go. That's really helpful. All right, Mark chapter 16. Now, we are, uh, we're at Missions Conference, right? And I don't think it's a secret that uh, part of our goal and desire is to see an increase in missions giving. Um, I know Pastor and I were talking, you know, he doesn't put a number out there. You know, he, he just wants you to find God's will and do what God wants you to do. And, uh, but, but we do hope to see, uh, you know, the gospel go forward, take some steps forward uh, in, uh, in, in, in being able to take on missionaries, as he mentioned this morning. And, uh, and so I'm going to do what preachers aren't supposed to do. I'm going to talk about money this morning. And uh, somebody said that money talks, I'll not deny. I heard it once. It said goodbye. And uh, you might be able to relate to that. Uh, <clears throat> John Wesley is reported to have uh, preached a sermon one time. They had three points. And the first point was, get all you can. And there was a miserly fellow there at the meeting that day. And he heard him say that. And he said, wow, I like that. That's a, that's a good sermon. And he said, amen. You know, and, and uh, then the second point came. And uh, Wesley said, keep all you can. And boy, this rich miserly fellow said, amen to that. And uh, then he got to the third point. And Wesley said, give all you can. And the rich man turned to the man next to him and said, what a shame to spoil a good sermon. You know? <laughs> and uh, so we'll try not to spoil the sermon this morning, but I, I don't want to tax your time. Uh, but I do want to get across some, some simple but helpful thoughts uh, this morning about missions giving. Uh, I want to ask a simple question. How should we think about missions giving? And so I want to, I want to unload on you a philosophy, if you will, a way of thinking about missions giving. And so we're going to start with the Great Commission. We're going to go all the way. Uh, we're going to focus a lot of our attention on Philippians chapter 4. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but we're going to cover a lot of material. So if you've got a pen and paper, uh, I would encourage you maybe jot down some of the references. Because I'm not going to turn to all of them. I will summarize some of them. I'll quote some of them because I've got them in my notes. Some of them we'll turn to. Uh, but if you want to take notes, that might be a good idea uh, this morning. Because we're going to cover a lot of material. But uh, Mark chapter 16 and verse number 15, and if, uh, if you don't mind and you're able, let's go ahead and stand out of respect for God's word this morning. 
And uh, I'll read verse number 15. You can just follow along, but I want you to see that it's in God's word, right? And uh, so verse number 15, and he said unto them, and of course the he there is Jesus. This is after his resurrection. He appears to his disciples and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to study your word. And I pray that you would speak to us through it. Lord, please guide and direct my words and thoughts. Lord, I, I don't want to uh, tax uh, your people's patience or, uh, or take more time than is necessary. But, Lord, we do want to allow you to work in our hearts. And so I pray uh, that you would guide and use the preaching this morning. Lord, speak to our hearts in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. <clears throat> Now, hopefully, if you've been saved for a while and been uh, listening to the preaching of your pastor, and, and uh, hopefully you've come to understand uh, that a Bible-believing church <clears throat> exists for one main purpose, and that is to glorify God. And in glorifying God, the main task that God has given the local church is that of the Great Commission. Again, Mark 16, 15 tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Take note of uh, three things here. First of all, the place. All right, where are we to go? All the world. All the world. Secondly, notice the people. All right, every creature. All right, not just the ones that maybe have the same uh, uh, skin color or, or uh, background that we do, but, uh, but every creature, every human being has a, has an, uh, has a, uh, a uh, uh, can, can expect from us the gospel. Uh, so I put it this way, that everyone who is saved has an obligation to everyone who is not saved to tell them how to be saved. And Amen. that is the truth. And so we need to go to all the world. We need to preach the gospel to every creature. And then the third thing in this verse, notice the preaching. And, and the preaching is not, uh, you know, it's not uh, just preaching, you know, good deeds or a better life or something like that. But it's preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, if you're new, that means the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was not just a man, not just a good teacher, but he was God in the flesh. He was God's son who came and really showed us all that we need to know about God and then died on the cross as a perfect sacrifice for your sins and mine and rose again three days later proving that he really was who he claimed to be and proving that everything he said was absolutely trustworthy. And we are to preach that message into all the world. Now, Luke chapter 24, in verses 46 through 48, we won't turn there for sake of time, but uh, there Luke records that Jesus clarified that preaching the gospel includes preaching repentance. In other words, a response to the gospel where we turn from uh, our, our sinful ways and our selfish thinking and we recognize that Jesus is who he claims to be. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is the only one that can save us, and we trust him and receive him as our Savior. And so he says we need to preach repentance and then the resulting remission of sins as we preach the gospel. We're not just telling the story, but we're applying it to those who need it. But then in Matthew chapter 28, and if you want to turn there, you can, but I've got it in my notes here, so I won't be here long, but Verse number 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So notice here he gives us three tasks associated with the Great Commission. It's not just the proclaiming of the gospel and telling people they need to repent because of it and receive remission of sins, but also we are to make them disciples. That's that idea of that, of that, uh, that word teach. So we're telling them how to be saved. We're telling them they need to become disciples of Jesus Christ. And then we're baptizing those who get saved and then teaching them to observe all things that Jesus commanded. And the idea of observe is, is not that you look at it, right? Uh, but it's the idea that you, you, you put it into practice. 
All right, that you learn what Jesus taught and you live it. That's what a disciple is and what a disciple does. And, and it's the job of the church to get them saved, get them baptized, but then to teach them to obey yeah. what Jesus said. So here's my question this morning. Are we fulfilling the Great Commission? All right, based on Matthew, if we are going to teach converts to observe all that Jesus commanded, all right, that, that, that's necessary for us to really fulfill the Great Commission. We've got to, we've got to disciple people. But uh, but if we're going to do that, uh, then they have to be able to be a part of the church, Man. right? Because uh, Matthew 18, for instance, uh, you know, if you have a problem with your brother, you're supposed to take it before the church, right? If you can't reconcile it one-on-one -on -one or with the help of one brother, you bring it before the church, right? So if you don't have a church, how are you going to obey that verse, right? It can't be done. And so <clears throat> implied in the Great Commission is that we are planting churches. Now... <clears throat> Mark says that we have an obligation to go to all the world and to preach to every creature. Now, how are we doing with that? <laughs> uh, I dare say that Bayview Baptist Church has not quite done that yet, right? Haven't quite completed the task. Uh, nor has probably any independent Baptist church in the world, right? Uh, at least not in the day we live in. <clears throat> but in the book of Acts we see how the apostles who were personally trained by Jesus gradually, if I put it this way, I, this may not be the right way to put it, but they gradually figured out how to do it, how to fulfill the Great Commission, how to get to the gospel to every creature in all the world. And uh, we're just going to touch on one aspect of that uh, this morning. But, uh, but as we get into the book of Acts, if you want to flip over there to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and we'll, we'll catch a few highlights here in the book of Acts. And uh, so the Great Commission is given to us five times. And uh, here's the, uh, uh, the final time that's recorded for us in Acts 1 verse 8. Uh, Jesus says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So notice that this first church there in Jerusalem... God gave them the responsibility to evangelize Jerusalem. But he said, you also need to get the gospel to all of Judea, all right, which would be the, uh, you know, the, the province that they lived in. You know, we could compare it maybe to the county you live in. Uh, and uh, you need to reach that whole area. And, and then you also need to go to Samaria, which not only were there uh, racial tensions there, but, uh, but Samaria would have been like the next county over, you know, it's, it's a little farther away, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, there's no limit to that. Uh, you can keep going around in circles trying to find the uttermost part, right? Uh, it, it means the whole world, right? It needs to hear the gospel. And notice that we're both. He said, I want you to be witnesses of me both in Judea. And that means that, means that, that this, is, this is supposed to take place uh, simultaneously. Right. Man. All right. It's not do this first and then do this and then do this. But they had a responsibility to evangelize Jerusalem, which we see they did a good job with. But you also need to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, so how does that play out? Well, the first, eight, or the first uh, seven chapters, at least, we see that the gospel is very much focused on Jerusalem. We read a lot about what's going on in Jerusalem. We don't read about anybody going anywhere else preaching the gospel. But we get to chapter 8 and something happened. There was some persecution. Uh, Stephen was stoned to, get to death. There was a, a, a lot of pressure on the believers. And, uh, and, and, and it wasn't that they went running out of Jerusalem scared. But it, it awakened them and... Were, and, and made them stop and think, I think, to, to say, you know, maybe, maybe it's time that we do the rest of what Jesus told us to do. And so in, in uh, Acts chapter 8, verse number 1, it says, Saul was consenting unto his death, talking about Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Notice the singular church uh, at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the apostles stayed there. Uh, but for the most part, the, the, the most, most of the church members left Jerusalem. Now, as, as we read it, we, we might get the idea that they were you know, running scared or something like that. 
Um, but continue on, it says, devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great limitation for him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. <coughs> Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. All right, so they didn't scatter to hide. They scattered to preach the word. Uh, I, I'm not a great Greek expert, but I'm told that the word that's translated scattered there, uh, that there's different words for scattered. One can mean like you're scattering a seed. Another can mean like scattering like a bunch of cockroaches when you turn the light on, right? And, uh, and that the word scattered here is the idea of scattering seed, that they, right. it, was, it was intentional. They were, they were reaching out to Judea and beyond with the gospel. And so they went everywhere preaching the gospel. And again, notice who this was. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Well, who was scattered? Well, if we go back to verse number one. It was not the apostles, right? It wasn't the ordained preachers, uh, as we would think of today, maybe. But it, it, was, it was the whole church began to reach out and, and go to these different towns and villages and go and preach the gospel. Now, you say, what was the result of all that? Well, when we get to chapter 9, <clears throat> and verse number 31... We read this, after Saul gets saved, uh, the persecution lightens up a little bit. And so in chapter 9, and verse number 31, it says, Then had the churches rest throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and, and the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So notice, in verse 31, we find, first of all, that there's churches, plural. This is the first time you'll find in the New Testament the word church in a plural form. And so it's the first time we find a reference to more than one church. Remember, it was just the church in Jerusalem at first. Now we've got churches, and where are they? They're in Judea, Galilee, Samaria. All right, so, so the, the, uh, that first church is beginning to fulfill the responsibilities uh, to reach out to other areas. Now, so here's the picture we have so far, Okay. That as a church, it's our responsibility to evangelize our area, right? But then it's also our responsibility as we're able to reach out a little farther. And eventually, maybe this church will plant another church somewhere. Uh, it certainly could use some more churches in this part of Florida, right? And, uh, and, 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 and that's churches planting churches. That's what we did in, uh, uh, out of Amboy, Illinois. We, uh, our church started a church in Princeton, Illinois. And, and, uh, and, and our pastor would love to do some more of that in the future. And, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, Brother Ted's son-in-law will be a part of that someday. But uh, we'll see. But, uh, but God has, uh, has put that work on, on the responsibility of churches. All right? So... Well, if that's how we're going to evangelize the world, though, that's going to take a long time, isn't it? So let's continue on. In Acts chapter 10, um, the gospel begins to go to the Gentiles uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Cornelius, the centurion. Uh, and then we get to chapter 11, and uh, Barnabas is sent up to Antioch to help organize the church. They heard a bunch of people got saved up there, and so Barnabas uh, gets sent from the church at Jerusalem to go up there and uh, set things in order, so to speak, and establish them in the faith. And he stays there. Uh, I, I think it uh, seems that he you know, kind of became the pastor of that church. And uh, in chapter 11, verse 19, uh, tells the story of that. And uh, in the process, he invites Saul to come help him there. Okay, Saul, who will later be known as the Apostle Paul. And so he kind of becomes Barnabas's assistant pastor, if we can use modern terminology, okay? And, uh, and so now that the stage is kind of set, so we get to Acts chapter 13, and here's, here's where we'll actually uh, stop and read a few verses here. So in Acts chapter 13, here we are at the church at Antioch. It says, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, which was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So Barnabas is still there, Saul's still there, but now they've got some other preachers that have been uh, entered into the ministry as well. And as the minister of the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereinto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And then verse 4 says, So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. So the church sent 
But because the church was in, in acting under the direction of the Holy Spirit, really it was the Holy Spirit sending them. Right. That's how God works. He, yep. he uses churches to, uh, he, he gives the people of the church a unity of the Spirit to confirm his plan to send people out. And so Paul and, and uh, uh, Barnabas are sent out now to be what we would call today missionaries. And, of course, you can read their missionary journeys over the rest of the book of Acts, how they traveled to uh, all these different places around the Mediterranean Sea and preached the gospel and saw people saved and saw churches started. And so now we see that if we're going to reach farther than our church can physically reach, well, then we need to send people out. Right? We need to send people to go farther, send people to go and preach in areas that we can't reach. And we call that today missions. But here's the question I want to ask to help us get to our final question of how we should think about missions is um, how were these men supported? Now, with Paul and Barnabas, we are not given a lot of the details. But if you read their story, you don't find them. You know, we, we, we do find sometimes in Paul's life where he was making tents, right? But we don't find that taking place on like this first missionary journey. Uh, we don't see that all the time. So I, I don't think it's right to say that he always made tents to support himself. Uh, I think that that would be reading too much into the scripture. But if we do study the scriptures carefully, I think we can come to some good conclusions. Um, <clears throat> we find that, uh, uh, let's see here. So <clears throat> so we've, we've seen kind of the, uh, the plan thus far for the Great Commission. Well, now let's think about the financial aspect of that. How, how do the finances fit into this plan? How do we, how do we pay for sending somebody uh, to a foreign land or a foreign state or a foreign town uh, to preach the gospel? Well, turn with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter number four. Philippians chapter number four. And uh, I, I probably should have had you mark a spot in Acts, but we'll, uh, we'll get back there anyway. I've got a new Bible, so it takes me as long to turn as it takes you. So, <laughs> All right, so Philippians chapter 4 and uh, verse number 10. Now, of course, the letter to the Philippians is a tremendous, tremendous letter in so many ways. But in verse number 10, Paul says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. And you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Now, I love lame jokes. Okay, So I always ask the question here, well, how did Paul know that they stopped caring for him and started caring for him again? All right. Obviously, it's not just talking about their feelings. Okay, You follow me? All right. So, so, they, so they did something that Paul describes as his care. Uh, has their, their taking care of him. So verse number 11, he said, not that I speak in, in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. So whatever this care was that they had, it had something to do with his wants, right? His, his, his need. Verse 12, he says, I know both how to be amazed and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And so he testifies of God's wonderful grace to help him through the good times and the bad. But verse 14 says, Notwithstanding ye have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. All right, so he says, don't get, don't get me wrong, it's not that I didn't want your money, okay? Uh, he says, you did well that you did communicate with my affliction. All right, time for another lame joke. All right, what's it mean to communicate with somebody's affliction? All right, if uh, I had a broken arm today, would that mean that you come talk to my broken arm, right? Communicate with, all right. Obviously, the word communicate here means more than how we normally use it today. All right, the idea of communicating in the scripture is usually the idea of, of sharing and, and, and involvement. And so he says, you've gotten involved with my affliction. You shared with me in my, in my affliction, my hardship, my difficulty, if you will. And it becomes clearer as we go. So in verse 15, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated, there's that word again, with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So this communication that was going on between the church of Philippi and Paul had to do with them giving him money and him receiving it. Okay? Verse 16, Freeman in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity, 
Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now, let's give some thought to this. What is this talking about? Well, if we compare to the book of Acts, we can see the historical context of what Paul's talking about when this, this giving and receiving took place. Uh, and so keep your place in Philippians because that's where our focus will be. But let's go to Acts chapter 17 and uh, I'll show you some of these details. So in Acts chapter 16, Paul has uh, begun his second missionary journey. Um, and in the uh, in the in verses 10 through 31, he, he uh, preaches the gospel in Philippi and gets a church started there. And what an exciting story that was. Uh, and if you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to read it later. But in uh, in chapter 17, all right, so remember, Paul, Paul received that Macedonian vision, right? That's why he's in Philippi. So God led him there. And uh, some have suggested that 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 uh, <clears throat> that the church at Antioch maybe had been supporting him beforehand, but on, on this journey, he's going you know beyond what his original commission was. Uh, I, I, that's reading between the lines a little bit, but uh, <clears throat> but as he goes into uh, chapter 17, he's now in this area of Macedonia still. And in verse number one, it says, "Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where it was the synagogue of the Jews, and as Paul met, Paul." Uh, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scripture. So, so Paul here is in Thessalonica preaching the gospel, and, and uh, long story short, he sees a church started there. That's why we have the First and Second Thessalonians in the New Testament. He writes to that church later on. But if you skip down to verse number ten, once he leaves Thessalonica, uh, it says the brethren immediately sent away saw, uh, Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. And so they took his preaching very seriously in Berea. But again, he's still preaching in Macedonia. What are we looking for here? Well, again, if you remember in Philippians, he says, Now you Philippians know also that the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia. All right, so, so let, let, let's focus here. So he started the church in Philippi in Macedonia. Now he started the church in Thessalonica. Now he started the church in, um, in Berea. And uh, we continue on in verse number 15. And he leaves Berea. Now, uh, let's see, verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving the commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, uh, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So he goes to Athens and... Uh, he ends up preaching the gospel there, uh, but uh, but Athens now he's no longer in Macedonia. All right, now he's entered a, a new region, uh, the uh, Roman province of Achaia. Now he's not going to spend a lot of time in Athens. He moves from Athens on to Corinth in chapter 18, and that's where he will establish a church. And so he begins a church in uh, in Achaia now. So he has now left Macedonia. Right, that's what we were looking for. Uh, in Philippians. So in Philippians chapter 4, <clears throat> so let's think this through a little bit. <clears throat> so he says, Now you Philippians know also, verse number 15, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So he says, When we left Macedonia to go into Achaia to eventually preach the gospel and start a church in Corinth, he said, You were the only church that was sending us financial support. All right, that's interesting. But then notice he also says in verse 16, he says, For even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again unto my necessity. So he says, while we were in Thessalonica. Now, when did he go to Thessalonica? All right, in case you forgot. All right, that was chapter 17. That was right after he left Philippi. That was the, that was the next place he went. He says twice he sent us financial support while we were there in Thessalonica. And, uh, and and we continue on in his story. He says, uh, uh, not because I desire a gift, but I desire a fruit that may abound to your account. So they were investing in his ministry. Now, so let's, let's, let's stop and, and make sure we caught all this, all right? So the church at Philippi, they get saved. Paul leaves Philippi after he's discipled them and he feels they're ready. He moves on to preach the gospel in another town and and that next town is Thessalonica. And the church of Philippi began supporting him right away. Yeah. 
We, we have record of at least three times here. We'll see an implication of maybe a fourth when he's in Corinth. And, uh, and, and so it's really not unreasonable to think that maybe they were starting to do this on a regular basis. Right? Maybe, maybe a monthly basis. <clears throat> and so they began to support Paul financially. Now, <clears throat> sorry, I've got ahead of my notes here a little bit. So, so there's no reason to think that at any time they stopped doing this. Um, there's no reason to think that Paul didn't teach this practice to other churches. As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 7, uh, Paul, in writing to the church of Corinth, he says, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that she may be exalted? Because I've preached the gospel of God freely. Right? He, ne he never took up any collections from Corinth to pay for his ministry. Verse number 8, he goes on to explain. He said, I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And all things I've kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. So Paul says that there was more than one church that was supporting him. And he says that, that at least there was churches in Macedonia, more than one church, not just the church of Philippi, but perhaps the church of Thessalonica, the church of Berea. Uh, we don't know. Maybe there's even others involved. <clears throat> but they were sending support while he was in Corinth. So again, we see the church of Philippi sent money to support Paul uh, when he was in Thessalonica. Sent again while he was in Thessalonica. Sent again when he left to go into Achaia. And then sent again, uh, it seems, while he was in uh, Corinth. And, uh, and this isn't an isolated thing either. Uh, we, Romans chapter 15. In verse number 24, uh, perhaps not the first passage you think of when you think of missions, but in verse 24, Paul says, When so I take my journey into Spain. All right, if you read chapter 15, he says, I've run out of places to preach the gospel on, on this side of Rome, and so I'm, I'm heading for Spain to preach the gospel there. And uh, he says, When I, when I, uh, uh, once I take my journey to Spain, I will come to you. So he's coming to Rome, for I trust to see you in my journey, and notice this phrase. And be brought on my way thitherward by you. Now, that's one of those phrases that's easy to kind of gloss over when you're reading, you know, last couple chapters of Romans. Uh, but it's a very important phrase. It's used some eight times in the New Testament, and every time it refers to somebody being sent on a mission from a church. And what that church is doing is providing what that person <coughs> needs for their mission. And uh, whether it's money or helpers or food or travel arrangements or whatever it might be, they took care of their need. And so Paul essentially is doing what we call today deputation, right? This church at Rome is, is a little bit different because this church wasn't one of the churches that Paul had started, right? It wasn't like Philippi or Berea or Thessalonica where he started the church. Uh, and so he's reaching out to this church that he doesn't have a relationship with officially, um, you know, he knows some of the people there, but he doesn't have a, a, an official connection with them. And he's asking them to provide the financial needs he needs to get to Spain. And uh, sounds a lot like deputation to me. Um, <clears throat> then in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul, in uh, writing to that church of Corinth, you know, he talked about how he preached the gospel to them freely. But in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 14, he says, For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure. As though we reached not unto you, for we came as far as unto you in, in preaching the gospel of Christ. Not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope. Now listen to how Paul describes his hope for the church of Corinth. Having a hope that when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. All right, now what does that mean? <clears throat> All right, it means... Paul said, well, I'm hoping that you'll grow in faith enough that when we come next time, you'll take us to the buffet so I can get enlarged by you, right? <clears throat> All right, that, 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 that actually is a, a fitting description of deputation sometimes. But, but no, notice what he says he, he's, in the next verse. He says that this, this enlarging, all right, what does it mean? He defines it in the next verse. It's to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. What's Paul saying? He's saying, once you've grown in faith enough to really understand how this works and really embrace it and believe it and trust in God's plan, then I believe you'll start supporting us too. That's what he's telling. <clears throat> and so missions giving 
is God's plan. Amen. It's God's plan for fulfilling the Great Commission to enable a church to reach beyond how, you know, how far they can physically reach so that they can get the gospel to all the world, to every creature, just like Jesus said. Amen. Now, let's go back to Philippians and quickly... <clears throat> We'll try to grab the uh, applications here as we look at the product. So we looked at the plan. Let's see the product. What happens when we get involved in God's plan for giving to missions? Well, first of all, there's a propagation of the gospel. All right, the gospel goes forward. In verse 16, Paul said, For even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again into my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound. Of course, that fruit is about souls being saved through his preaching in these other places. And so the gospel goes forward. The gospel goes to the lost because we give to missions. Now, why does this matter? Well, think about it. We have a responsibility to preach the gospel in all the world to every creature. And the only way we can do that is if we get some help. And that's what a missionary is. <clears throat> you know, we use that term deputation. Uh, and the reason we use that word is that, that missionaries become the church's deputies. Mm -hmm. All right. They become your representative. So that when you give to missions, it's not about what you're doing for the missionary. It's really about what you're doing through the missionary. Yes. As you fulfill and discharge your great commission responsibilities. Man, that's good, bro. Maybe you back to church, maybe a young church, but you've got a responsibility right. to get the gospel to all the world. And that's where missionaries come into play. Now, <clears throat> as we do that, we should think of it like an investment. You remember, <clears throat> someday we are going to give account to the Lord Jesus Christ for our lives. Man. And, uh, and I know we, we all have to spend time, you know, making a living, pay the bills. But you know, you can redeem some of that time by using some of that money to invest in missions. You know, Jesus said that we should lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and thieves can't break through and steal and inflation can't erode it away. I added that part. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> but we can lay up treasures in heaven by investing in that which is eternal. And the only thing eternal in this life is the souls of men. So we need to invest in that which is eternal. And by giving financially to support the work of missionaries, we are buying stock, if you will, in what God is doing through them. And there is fruit that will abound to our account when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And so we see the propagation of the gospel. Notice verse number 18, another product of missions giving. He says, but I have all abound, I am full, having received to Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Notice this phrase, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Now, <clears throat> those obviously are pointing us back to some Old Testament imagery, Right? Those days when they made animal sacrifices and God said it was a sweet smelling savor and it, 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 it appeased his, his, uh, his justice and so on. And, uh, and, and of course, it all, all those sacrifices picture Christ, but they also picture the sacrifices we should make in our Christian life today. Sacrifices that are pleasing to God. Sacrifices that honor God. And he says that when we give to missions, we are giving a sacrifice that pleases God. Now, notice it is a sacrifice. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't hurt some of us to give up, uh, you know, a couple trips to the coffee shop to give a little extra to missions. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with sacrificial giving. But also notice that it's a gift to the Lord. It's an expression of our love to Him. Now, again, look at how Paul describes it. He said that uh, it's an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. It pleases God. And so we find the pleasure of God in our sacrifice. That though it's given through the church, 
And though it's given to a man, the, the missionary that's preaching somewhere, it's really a gift to God. And as such, he is pleased by it. And if you love him, you desire to please him, do you not? Yeah. This is one of the ways you can. Then last, look at verse number 19. The last <clears throat> product of missions giving is uh, that God gives us a special promise to the giver. Now, whenever you study the scriptures, you always need to study it in its context, right? <clears throat> and uh, if, if, if I were to step outside the will of God and go to the local, I don't know if you have a local casino, but go to the nearest casino and gamble away all my money and then come back and say, but God's going to supply all my need. Uh, guess what? That promise doesn't apply to me. <laughs> all right. But <clears throat> if I do what the people here did, then the promise does apply to me. <clears throat> you see, giving to missions is an opportunity to see God work. You know, most of the time when we give to missions, we're giving out of money that, that really eventually we're going to need. Right? Amen. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with my van, but I know that someday something's going to break. A tire's going to go flat. Something's going to go wrong, right? Somewhere along the line, there's going to be a dental need. You know, somewhere along the line, there's going to be some unexpected bill, and I'm going to need that money. And so the world would say, well, better save it up for that rainy day, right? But God says if we give to missions, then he will take care of it. If we trust God with the future and say, Lord, what do you want me to do with my money now? Okay, you want me to give X amount of dollars to missions? Then I'm just going to obey your will and do it. God promises and, and, and inspires. Think about the context here. Paul's writing to this church. He writes this great, church, this great letter about rejoicing in the Lord while he's you know, sitting in prison, you know, he knows what he's talking about. You can rejoice in any circumstance. And he writes to them and says, man, you've given generously to me. Amen. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God says, now tell them that your God is going to supply all their need according to his riches and glory Amen. by Christ Jesus. <clears throat> you see, if we are giving to missions out of money that we're eventually going to need in order to meet the missionaries' needs, you know, does that mean that we're going to have to go without our needs being met? Well, again, Paul here says to this church, hey, you've been given, God will take care of your need. And if you're not giving to missions, if you're not, if you, if you haven't taken that step of saying, all right, yeah, I'm going to start investing in, in missions, Above my tithe and offering, I'm going to set aside X amount of dollars or even X amount of cents, whatever it might be, <clears throat> to give to missions on a weekly or monthly basis. Friends, you're missing out on one of God's precious promises. And you're missing out on an opportunity to see God work to meet your needs along the way. <clears throat> these, these, these promises from God are, are throughout the Scripture. Let me just give you one more. Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. <clears throat> you see, giving to missions is something we should be very excited about. Right. You see, how should we think about missions giving? Boy, we should think about our responsibility. I need to get the gospel to all the world. We as a church need to do that. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, one of the ways we're going to do it is through giving to missions. We discharge that responsibility. We begin to invest in eternal uh, investments. But not only that, but God is pleased by our action of giving to missions. And God promises us that he'll take care of our needs. And so how should we think about missions giving? Well, to put it simply, we ought to be excited about it. We ought to be getting on our knees and say, Lord, I'm so excited. I, I want to give to missions. How much can I give? And let him lay a number on your heart. And he'll bless and use it in mighty ways. Let's pray while the pastor come close as he sees fit. Lord, we do thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful <coughs> privilege of giving to missions and being a part of that great work of evangelizing the whole world. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to take very seriously as we consider our role in it and, and what we ought to invest in.